Hey, welcome back to another installment of the Wide Ride Podcast. I'm Andy Navarro, Miami Hurricanes beat writer for The Athletic. It's Thursday, April 20th, right around 5.20 p.m. And I'm joined today uh, for today's episode by Frank Tucker, who many of you may know as The Crib South Florida on Twitter. He writes for Canes County, the Rivals uh, site uh, website, and he also runs the Dade Broward All-Star Game since 2021. Frank, uh, you know, back when I when I did high schools for the Miami Herald many, many years ago, um, you know, I was on the sidelines every night. And now that I'm back, you know, co- kind of covering college football, I'm not out there every night on the high school sidelines. But every time I am out there, I see you there. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're probably as dedicated as anyone to um, getting to know these players and developing relationships with them. And I kind of wish you were around when I was doing the high school stuff two decades ago. I know I'm a little older than you. So uh, I, I kind of wish we would have been able to, to bump shoulders then, but you do a great job. And, and I want to thank you for coming on the show. No, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, I, I try to just put my best foot forward, uh, you know, in, in covering these kids. They deserve the best coverage possible. We know how much, how much talent is in South Florida. So, for me to be out there every day the same way they're doing is, is just kind of the MO of like Larry Bluestein, who I try to follow mm-hmm. in, in his path the best way that I can. So I appreciate you for taking notice of that. And thanks for once again having me on the show. Well, I, I, I brought you on in large part because you and I got to hang out basically for two days up in Orlando for the OT7 tournament. And last year I flew out to Vegas for the for the actual um, it was like a three or four day tournament at, uh, at the time. It was hot as hell in the middle of of June and Miami was sort of in the middle of that whole Jaden Rashada thing, trying to get him on board. And it was just an interesting time. Now they've kind of split it up into regionals. And so we have one here in Orlando. That's quote unquote, the East regional. There'll be another one in Baltimore coming up. Uh, They had, I think one in Phoenix for the West coast. And I think another in Texas previously. So it's like a four part series. And then the championships are actually in California, I think in June, which, I guess I'll be going out there for that, but we got to see a lot of guys that were really good, you know, big time athletes. Uh, One of one of the teams you work with a lot, DEFCON um, one ended up winning the tournament. They beat a team from California power quarterbacked by CJ Carr, the Notre Dame commitment, a lot of stud talents on the field. Um, You know, when I, when I started, this tells you how old I am, Frank, uh, none of the seven on seven stuff was, was quite like this. And then it was sort of in the infancy at South Florida express. I don't even think it even existed when I was still doing high school. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of these, um, kids, you only got to see them during the high school season. We're going to get into a lot of that in a little bit. Um, but let's start with the big news, which is Tyler Van Dyke is expected to stay at the university of Miami. And, um, you know, over the last few days, I'd say it's pretty been pretty, pretty crazy. I think Tyler's going to put out a statement in a bit, but I got word a little while ago. He has a new NIL deal. He's going to stay and be the Hurricanes quarterback. A lot of chatter that he might leave via the transfer portal after the spring game, which I think was sort of a surprise to some people knowing Tyler and his representatives and some of his people for a while. um, I know that obviously they're looking for the best situation for him to get him to the NFL, but I'm going to start with you and your opinion on Tyler. You watched him in the spring game. You watched him last year. Um, how important was it for Miami to bring Tyler back for them to get, get to that eight win mark that they really have to, to keep fans quiet this year. You have to keep Tyler Van Dyke because we saw what Jakari Brown was in the spring game. It was like five of 13 or something along those lines. Emory Williams is obviously not ready to be the starting quarterback of the Miami Hurricanes. He's still supposed to be in high school right now. So it's vital for Miami to be able to keep Tyler Van Dyke in the building. If you still had Jake Garcia, it could be a conversation of, you know, letting things slide maybe, but keeping him in the fold is so important because it's an air raid offense. Now this is going to be an offense predicated on a productive passing attack that we haven't seen in recent memory at the university of Miami. And to make that happen, you have to have a quarterback that's capable of doing just that. And Shannon Dawson knows how valuable Tyler Van Dyke is. He knows how valuable it is to have a quarterback that fits his scheme. That's why when we're seeing guys like Judd Anderson and Emery Williams, you know, really start to look good in that offense, he's recruiting for traits. Well, Tyler Van Dyke has some of those traits to be able to utilize the vertical passing attack, utilize, you know, making guys, uh, you know, big play threats on a consistent basis. So, yeah, he's he's an important part of this Miami team in 2023. Yeah, and I think for Miami fans, you know, 
we're, we're pretty critical, right, of, of everybody who plays at the program. People have turned on James Williams pretty quickly when he struggles, right, and he misses tackles. Uh, they jump down the throat of the coaches, you know, after one or two bad games. Tyler Van Dyke at his peak uh, when he was – those last six games of his ACC Rookie of the Year season was as good as any quarterback in the country. And maybe he's not a first-round pick, okay? Maybe he's a, a day two or day three draft pick down the road. But he's, he's one of the better quarterbacks, I think, in college football when he's healthy, when he's got an offensive line, and he's got a difference maker to work with at the wide receiver position. And Miami's still working to improve that wide receiver position room. They're looking at guys in the transfer portal. We'll talk about some of that stuff in a little bit. But I, I think ultimately, had he left, this would have been a step back for the program. Maybe they find somebody in the transfer portal to replace him. But it would not have been easy to go into the fall without having a bona fide starter in the lineup. 110%. And going back to your point that you said about the receivers, I think the receivers surprised a little bit this spring. Jacoby George finally coming back healthy, no suspension right now. He's finally looking like the Jacoby George that everybody expected coming out of Plantation High School as a four-star receiver. Colby Young is obviously a high potential player, could be an early round draft pick as soon as next year. Isaiah Horton finally stepped up, was injured last year as a freshman. You know, they loved, they loved what they saw from him coming out of high school as a 6'5", 210-pound threat on the outside. Very similar to Colby Young, maybe not as explosive as an athlete, but he's a guy that this staff really likes. And then, obviously, there's talent in the slot. Rashard Smith hasn't done it at Miami, but we've seen how good he was at Palmetto. He was one of those guys that Kane fans were excited about when he came to Miami in that 2021 class. Then you got Xavier Restrepo, who's – a consistent force for this Miami team at 50 yards in the first drive of this spring game on last week, Friday. And then you got the two really good young players in Ray, Ray Joseph and Robbie Washington, who I think are going to be really special players. So putting those guys around Tyler Van Dyke, I think you're going to see more of a 2021 Tyler Van Dyke than you are a 2022 Tyler Van Dyke. Yeah. And I think he's going to be in the right scheme. Um, I think the, having the better offensive line, once you get JV and Cohen, um, and then as Cooper in there, they didn't play in the spring game. So I know that obviously affected some of the time that Tyler had to throw. So he'll have his best offensive line when the season starts, we think. And I know Miami's also obviously looking to add Mario's always looking to add talent <laughs> via the transfer portal. They offered the uh, the kid from Wyoming whose name escapes me right now off the top of my head. Um, but I know he's one of the top uh, transfer portal type targets. So um who knows if they're able to add him once Zion Nelson gets back and he's healthy, assuming he's still part of this program. I think you're going to have six, seven, eight guys deep on that offensive line. And if they're able to get a speed receiver on the outside with some experience, the way that they were like Charleston Rambo a couple years ago, I think that'll really help this offense take off and hit a new level. But those are all things that they're working towards now. It's still very early in the transfer portal period, so to speak. I think guys are just really beginning to announce that they're, that they're going in. So we'll see some more names surface um ahead but <clears throat> i apologize i got a little like hair in my throat it feels like uh frank but uh, good news for miami uh hopefully at some point uh when we put this podcast out tyler will, will have put out a statement and said something to sort of uh end the end the madness but oh jesus let me drink a little water here frank hold on a second <laughs> mm. Not fun when you got like uh, that, that little hair in your tongue there for a little bit. But um, but anyway, um, going back to the situation with Tyler and NIL, I know I know a lot of Miami fans have sort of been on edge because of some of the reports regarding John Ruiz. Right. And, and Life Wallet and how essentially here, um, you know, he could have some trouble with the SEC and, you know, uh, in terms of putting out the proper paperwork he needs to put out for his business, et cetera. I, I exchanged some text messages with John Ruiz today and all the payments to my knowledge, Frank, in terms of all the, all, all the guys under NIL deals for Miami, um, they've been paid to this point. I haven't had any players come to me and say, Hey, I'm not getting my, I'm not getting my check. I haven't heard of anybody saying that yet. Um, let's dive into the NIL for a minute. Cause it's obviously important in your experience when talking to players about NIL in Miami, has there been any drop off? Have you heard any sort of remnants of, hey, things are falling apart with the program here? I, I haven't. I haven't. With the, any of the kids that have gone in in this last class, which that was really the initial class that capitalized on that 
NIL wave uh, to start with that process. Uh, everything I'm hearing is everything is fine on that front. We saw, heard about Cormani McLean. Maybe there was a little bit of an issue there, but I think that was more so him wanting more money rather than Miami paying up. So Antoine Jackson, another situation where people scapul- speculated that it was an NIL thing. It was a girlfriend thing. That's why he went, went to East Carolina, had nothing to do with money. Uh, you know, so, so I think Miami overall is good. And, and I think people also have to understand Ruiz is not the only yeah. booster that for Miami that is, is funding NIL. Life Wallet is just at the forefront of everything because he's a very vocal character. It's just right. who he is. And another thing is, even if Life Wallet is having some business troubles, People got to understand when you make your business go public uh, on the on the New York Stock Exchange, usually you sell a lot of your stock in that company, yeah. right? So he, he capitalized when when he when they came out with a thirty plus billion dollar valuation uh, initially on the New York Stock Exchange. So it, I don't think that money's ever going to be a problem for Ruiz, <laughs> who is also you know a pretty competent lawyer, other than the life wallet situation. So. Overall, I don't think Miami is going to have any issues with NIL going forward. I think it's more outside fan speculation from Florida Gator fans, Florida State fans, and fans just kind of reading, you know, certain articles that are kind of attacking Ruiz. He's he's a guy who's put a target on his back a little bit, and yeah. honestly, it, it's it's more hate than it is, you know, truth to some of the stuff that's coming out about him personally. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'll say this, um, I, I think, you know, like you said, he's not the only one putting money into this. And in fact, when I talked to him shortly before the Miami's run to the final four, and I, I did a Q and a with him for the athletic, he mentioned how, you know, he, he helps the Canes connection and some of these other sort of entities that are, that are doing some of these deals with Miami's players um, because he has the experience of running an NIL system. So essentially he's giving these guys advice. He's helping manage it. Uh, but there's other people pouring money into it, other South Florida millionaires and billionaires, people who want to see the program succeed that are helping fund this. And the deal that TVD signed was not with Ruiz. The deal the, the deal that helped keep him here in South Florida was not with Ruiz. It was with um, other people. In fact, TVD is not even um, number one among the football players under Life Wallet, as far as Life Wallet deals are concerned. Uh, all all Ruiz was able to tell me today that it's a lineman. It's not a, it's not a quarterback and that TVD is in the top 5% in, in terms of his life wallet deal. So again, I, I think it's more a message of how healthy is Miami's NIL initiative. I talked to some people in Miami's administration today, people that pay bills, uh, which, which brings me to a little note here. If Miami was struggling so poorly, why are, uh, you know, the two basketball coaches who just had an incredible run, Uh, through the postseason tournament there's you know Jim Laranega and Katie Meyer both of them are getting raises Laranega is going to move from being a top six paid uh, coach in the ACC to top three uh, and he's getting another year on his deal so my financially I think while there's a lot of sort of information out there disparaging the Miami or sort of painting this picture they're in trouble I think they're doing just fine and obviously if TVD uh, was going to leave you would think that money would play somewhat of a role for him, right? And and leaving, obviously Miami took care of that. So I think ultimately here, uh, the bigger picture is Miami has a healthy NIL program and a healthy program in general, even coming off a five and seven season. Yeah, and and people got to understand that Miami's not the only school that deals with this issue. Alabama dealt with this issue with Javion Cohen. He was a guy that was going to demand more money. Alabama couldn't, wasn't going to pay it. And they've typically gone that route with the 2023 prospects as well. You heard some kids not go to the University of Alabama because of the lack of NIL structure, what was going on over there. Mark Fletcher, a lot of rumors came out about Mark Fletcher that he didn't go to Ohio State because Ohio State does not pay their freshmen substantial NIL figures. And it's just how it is. Brandon Innes was another kid that went to Miami because there was so much more money at the University of Miami than there was at Ohio State. He said it himself that he turned down hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to go to Ohio state rather than Miami. So I I think that Miami's fine on that end. And you're going to always have to recruit your own guys in the building. And there's always going to have to be pay raises. This is the minor league of the NFL now. And that's just where we're headed going forward. Frank, let's talk a little bit about Miami start on the recruiting trail, because I I do this podcast with uh, Ari Wasserman and Grace Rainer and Mitch Light, uh, the Stars Matter podcast for The Athletic now. I've joined that about three weeks ago. 
And, you know, there was kind of sort of a running joke about, man, you know, Florida State and Florida kicking ass on the recruiting trail and look at all these quote unquote three stars Miami is signing, right? Uh, in, in, or getting committed here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the only blue chip right now in the 247 composite, uh, which is what we use at The Athletic, uh, is uh, Chance Robinson, the receiver from St. Thomas Aquinas, who committed after the spring, right after the spring game. Um, but they've, they've kind of gone on a run of, quote unquote, under the radar kids here. And I think some people were looking at the situation and saying, man, why is Miami taking all these three stars? Does it have to do with their five and seven record? Does it have to do with NIL? I think this just has to do with the coaches identifying some guys that they really like that aren't highly ranked right now. Um, and I'll point out, OK, in this 247 composite rating, there's only 1,200 kids ranked right now. Normally, there's 2,200 or 2,300 per year. So I think it's more of a matter of these guys will move up into four-star status, et cetera. They're just underranked right now. What's your take, Frank, on, on the commitments that Miami's gotten? My take is this staff has an MO in recruiting, and they are following it to a T. This is very similar to, to the 2023 class. If you go back and look at the guys that committed before Jaden Rashada, it wasn't an influx of a ton of blue-chip talent. Right, Bobby Washington was not a four-star recruit yet. Robbie was a low four-star recruit. Uh, they, they got, you know, Emery Williams, who was a three-star recruit. All those guys committed early, and nobody really had an issue with it. I think people coming up a five and seven season are a little bit more scared, I guess you could say, and they want some really good news. But I think they got to trust the evaluations of Mario Cristobal and staff because – Judd Anderson is a 6'7", two-sport athlete that fits all the things that they want in this new air raid offense that Miami is implementing. Chris Wheatley Humphrey was one of the best backs in South Florida last year, averaged over 10 yards a carry, had four 200-yard games. If you were in South Florida as a guy that was on the ground, you knew Chris Wheatley Humphrey was one of the stars of South Florida, despite what his ranking may look like. And with us at Rivals, he is a borderline you know, almost four-star prospect. He's going to have that Chris Johnson type rise. And I, it's going to happen sooner than later. Uh, he's one of the better players in South Florida overall. Chance Robinson, we already know what he is. He's a four-star kid. Isaiah Thomas, for us at Rivals, is a four-star. So you got two blue chips in the class already. And then Dylan Day is a Lance Guidry special. This guy is going to slot him in at that nickel spot. He's six foot, 170 pounds. If you turn on the tape, he is an explosive athlete. You can come up and hit make plays on the ball. He is a Lance Guidry guy, and that's what he wants on this defense. And I think that the blue chips are going to be coming, right? T.A. Cunningham just made the move to Miami Central. I put a forecast in today on him, uh, you know, eventually committing to the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, you know, there are some other guys that might end up committing in this class, including Josiah Trader, who's a five-star commit. Juan Mendia is a guy that I think is going to shoot up the rankings. 6'6", 320 pounds. He, if Mario Cristobal and Alex Maribel are recruiting an offensive lineman, I'm trusting that evaluation yeah. time and time again. Tommy Kinzer <laughs> was a very similar case to Juan Mania. Tommy Kinzer was a low three-star prospect at offensive tackle. Mania is going to move inside just like Kinsler is. And once Kinsler, once uh, Mania gets put in that offensive guard ranking, I think he's going to move up to probably a four-star or high three-star status. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of these guys right now are just underrated. They have a lot of power five offers. It's not like they're being ignored. Manai, I think, had trips lined up to Duke and Maryland. I know people used to make jokes about Duke. You can't really make jokes about Duke anymore. They're nine and four. Maryland, you know, they're a Big Ten program, right? Big Ten and SEC are supposed to be the better conferences. So, uh, look, I, I just think right now you can make jokes about Miami's three stars and what, whatever, but th those are good players that the coaching staff believes in. And I would also remind people that last year, when you look at the 24 signees, 16 of them were blue chips, eight of them were three-star guys. And, oh, by the way, some of those three-star guys <laughs> – are pretty good that are on the team right now, right? So, I mean, Emery Williams, uh, sort of the perfect example, a guy who nobody really paid attention to, went goes to the Elite 11 and kicks ass and is one of the top five quarterbacks there. And now everybody's talking about, man, he, he might, you know, leapfrog Jakari Brown and be the starter once TVD leaves. So I think ultimately here, you know, you kind of have to give these coaches the benefit of the doubt on their guys and who it is that they're recruiting. Mario's one recruiter, uh, national, you know, awards, uh, in the past when he was at Alabama, I think some of the coaches that he's that he's gotten here, Lance Guidry uh, and Shannon Dawson do a good job with three star guys wherever they've been. They develop them. They turn them into good players. So 
I, I put my trust in them right now. And, and look, the bottom line is, Frank, they got to have better results this season, right? For any of us to continue to believe in this, you got to be better than five and seven. I think eight and four is sort of the magic number for this team. But I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt on these recruits. Who is, let me ask you this, Frank, you're, you're very plugged in and, and I've been on top of these, this latest run of commitments. I, I knew some of the names of the guys that they were close to getting. Who in your mind is the next commitment? So there's a few there's a few guys that we could be looking at. Cameron Pruitt, who's a three star outside linebacker type guy, super athletic pass rusher on the edge. Uh, he's going to be a guy that I think ends up committing. It could be soon uh, over the next week or so. I know this wave is going to be pretty uh, pretty uh, strenuous uh, for Miami. It's going to go at least another week. Um, another guy that I think they like and is probably close to committing is Ricky Knight the third, who is a four star prospect a defensive back out of West Palm, out of Benjamin. Uh, he has lit it up this offseason, plays for Florida Fire, went to the national, uh, I think it was the national All-American camp or something like that, and lit that up. Everybody raved about him. I think he had like 10 interceptions in the one-on-one -on -one setting. Uh, and another guy to watch is Caleb Odom, who you and I both saw this weekend for 24K, yeah. one of the uh, top seven on seven teams based out of Orlando, six foot five, 215 pounds, can play wide receiver, or tight end, I think he's going to be a guy that that probably commits sooner than later. Yeah, I think Caleb, when I had my conversation with him briefly, he mentioned Colorado. I think he's going to be going out there for, for an official visit. Obviously, I think he's intrigued by Deion Sanders. And I think as, as a Miami fan, you got to be worried whenever Deion is on top of some of these guys. But, hey, Colorado still has to go through their, their season coming up with a lot of transfers and new guys. We'll see how Colorado season pans out. So I think Colorado will be competition for Odom. But – uh, overall, again, they're in, they're in it for a lot of really good players, Frank. I mean, you think about that spring game, all the elite defensive linemen that were down here attending that game, um, guys that swung by camp, David Stone, right? Two weekends in a row, I think was down in Miami. Um, five-star guy in my mind. Um, so many good players. And the focus really is defensive line. I think that's the number one priority, right, with this class when we look at some of the, the more talented guys they may end up getting. Yeah, I think receiver and defensive line are, are pretty much the focus of this 2024 class. Uh, you know, they, they brought in two running backs in the last class. They loaded up on the offensive line as well as linebackers. So I think they're going to be really focusing on improving the defensive tackle position where they do like some of the guys that are currently in the building, like Ahmad Moten. Leonard Taylor is obviously a star. Um, but you, you're going to have some guys that graduate. You know, I, I don't think that Lichtenstein's going to be able to play, uh, you know, uh, another seven years. So right. it's uh, – He's eventually going to move out. So you got to you got to add depth. Right. And and speaking to a college coach, he was telling me that you got to recruit for depth. Sometimes you got to recruit for those guys that can play 10 to 15 plays in a game. Maybe not the superstars on your roster. And I think Miami is doing just that. It, there's there's I, they, I know Mario Cristobal and staff has kind of talked about like 40 percent, 40 plus percent of this roster is not what they expect to have at the University of Miami. There is a lot of dead weight on this roster that they've continued to try to flip. 22 guys have entered the transfer portal so far in this offseason, which is a huge number when you look at the landscape of college football. So I think overall there are going to be a lot of defensive linemen, a lot of receivers, and then there's going to be some influx of defensive back talent as well. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Ricky Knight. I know he was down at Florida State. Um, I think you mentioned the 10 interceptions in that camp. I think he's, again – uh, a guy that I think fits perfectly into the system. There's going to be opportunity to play, right? I mean, I think the cornerbacks that are on this roster right now, you got some older guys like to couch. Um, you got guys that I think could be passed up on the depth chart by some freshmen the day they, they arrive here. So we will see. Um, let's move on uh, and talk about the kids from California who moved here. You mentioned it already. Cunningham, the two Cunningham boys, the brothers, as well as, um, Beckham Kritza, the 2025 quarterback, all, you know, all out in California. I know the Cunningham's originally from Georgia, but I think from a, um, I don't know, white smoke perspective, uh, we go back to last year and we think about the kids from the West coast who moved to IMG Academy, right. And, and ended up signing with Miami, uh, committing to Miami. Um, I think we're, we're, we're headed in a similar boat here from Mario Cristobal. Whenever we see outsiders move to Florida, <laughs> For, for, uh, for high school ball, I think it's a pretty good sign Miami's got a good beat on them, right? Yeah, and they've all visited several times over the course of their recruitment. Uh, became Kritza and the Cunningham brothers are, are extremely close, um, almost family type, uh, you know, atmosphere with, with those, with that trio. Um, I, I think that 
Cunningham is a TA Cunningham. The elder Cunningham is pretty much a lock to the university of Miami. Chris has got a little bit of a longer process. He's visited Colorado, Texas A&M has been kind of rumored to, to be one of his favorites as well. So there's, there's still some time for other schools to jump in that race, but overall he's a borderline top 100 recruit in the country, four star, high four star prospect. And Miami is leaning in on him in that 2025 class. And I would not be surprised if he ended up as the first commit of 2025 after Cunningham eventually gets, commits to the University of Miami. The younger Cunningham is just getting in high school. So his process is going to be a little bit longer, right? He's got four years until he has to make a decision. But overall, I, 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 complete, I completely agree with you that this is a very similar process to that IMG migration that we saw in the last class. And there's a reason that Mario Cristobal is one of the best recruiters in the country. He gets kids to want to come to South Florida and be part of the process that is revitalizing the University of Miami. By the way, this is a technique he learned from Nick Saban. OK, Nick Saban sort of perfected this at Alabama. Kids would move into the Alabama area uh, and, and sort of uh, get closer to the university. And, and it, it just I don't know, it's, it's almost like proximity helps the situation, shows the dedication of the, of the college program, how badly they want them, et cetera. So, again, the more we see of this in, in, in the weeks and months ahead, the more white smoke for the fans who are wondering, who are we getting? Who are we getting? Uh, I think whenever you see this type of stuff happen, it's a good bet. Uh, Miami could be on the on the receiving end of good news. Let's talk about the OT7 tournament. Again, those DEF CON boys that won. Um, I want to start with Zaquan Patterson because he's one of my favorite players, I think, in the in this class, just getting a chance to talk to him uh, for a little while. Uh, New York native, moved to South Florida, you know, um, I guess when he was younger. Didn't start football till he was nine years old. And, of course, his first coach is Demarcus Van Dyke over at Miramar with the AYFL team. And he tells me how how close he was to DeMarcus, which I think in a lot of ways, knowing DVD just left to go take the job at FIU, right? You, you'd naturally be scared for Miami, like, uh-oh, this is a problem. But he seems pretty entrenched with the coaching staff uh, and the recruiting office, the guys that are in Miami's recruiting office. So it's a good sign. He's a top 100 recruit, one of the best safe. Kind of reminds me of Cam Kitchens a little bit, Frank, um, in terms of the way he plays the game with intensity and studying it and being really good at it. Um, I think he's the kind of guy who can come in and be the next Cam Kitchens. What's your impression of Zaquan who goes to Chaminade? So Zaquan, he's one of my babies. I've known uh -huh. Zaquan for a long time. So, you know, I got a lot of love for him. And I, and I think overall he's, in my opinion, and I'm a little biased that he's the best safety in the country. His athleticism shines through in everything that he does, whether it's blocking punts, which he has double digit of those in the last two years or mm -hmm. playing receiver, which we saw him do last weekend primarily and I think that DeMarcus Van Dyke leaving is definitely an impact in his decision because of the relationship that those two have but I don't he's talked time and time again that he's not making a decision based on a coach and another thing to kind of look at is does DeMarcus Van Dyke potentially come back to the University of Miami uh, you know a dies contract is up after this season so it, are they going to extend him right if are, are they going to look another direction uh, could they be looking for an, at another big time coach? Potentially all those things are in play, but I would not be surprised to see DeMarcus Van Dyke end up back at the University of Miami as a position coach in the next year or so, which could help with the Zaquan Patterson situation. So um, I think that Miami is a leader for him right now, but Ohio State and Michigan are two teams to watch there. I don't think Georgia and Florida State are as big a factor as people thought as before but I think it's a three-team race between those two big 10 options and the University of Miami. Yeah, he mentioned that to me. He, the other, I think the other school he mentioned to me might have been Auburn as another uh, potential uh, destination. He told me he wanted to go away to college when he first started this process because he wanted to leave home and just experience another place. But he says if the best situation for him is Miami, he's going to come here and play. So I think from a hurricane perspective, despite losing DVD, I think it's they're still in a very good standing because of the relationship they're building with him. Um, Talked to a lot of different kids. Uh, one of them uh, played for the South Florida Express, who, who kind of got knocked out relatively early in that tournament. In fact, uh, they got beat pretty deep by, by some of those receivers, young receivers on DEF CON, um, pretty, pretty regularly. Uh, it was impressive performance. But one guy um, who, who uh, actually doesn't play for SFE, he plays for Raw, my fault. Raw also lost, by the way, uh, kind of early in that tournament to California Power. Um, but... Uh, Dwayne McCoy from Miami Central, who committed to Florida State, um, 
you know, I know he's a guy that Miami obviously wants. They're still recruiting him. He mentioned that to me, but he committed to Florida State. And I got the impression, Frank, from talking to him that, um, you know, I, I don't think his parents were on that trip with him. Um, and and I, I tend to think it's far from over for LeWay McCoy. Oh, it's definitely far from over. That's a very early commitment. Uh, you know, Juke Joseph, his head coach, wasn't on that visit as well. Like you said, no family on the visit with him. So I think that there's still a case to be made that Miami's still in the race here. Remember, they didn't even offer until mid-January or a little bit later than that. So they were a little late. They were a little late to the party on the Wayne McCoy. And, and I think he was – if you go back to some interviews that I put out during the season last year, he was talking about he wanted that offer from the University of Miami. And that Miami Gardens Purple Machine group has talked about potentially playing together at the University of Miami. He is part of that. So I, I think if you see more uh, Chance Robinsons and Josiah Traders end up in the University of Miami's program, that's going to be another influence for him to consider Miami. So I think it's still a, still a long process for Luane. I think Auburn's a school that's still going to be on him. I think you could see like schools like UCF still be in the picture. UCF's a uh, is a power five school now. So people right. also have to take that into account. If this isn't UCF, that's group of five with Scott Frost anymore. This is them with a elite coach and Gus Malzahn and a power five conference. So um, I think that it's going to be a state of Florida battle probably for him. Uh, and I, and I don't think that it's, it's over as of yet. Okay. Well, those are two blue chip guys um, that were there. I mean, there were, look, there are a lot of kids there. We can sit here and talk about a bunch now that we've kind of hit on two main ones I wanted to address, let, let's dive into your impressions. Obviously, a lot of y great young players, but let's start with 2024. Who stood out to you among the best talents there? CJ Carr is a special quarterback, and yeah. talking to him, Miami has been in contact with him. I, I don't expect a flip from Notre Dame anytime soon, but they have inquired about what's going on in his recruitment. Tommy Reese left to go to Alabama. I think that was a factor in his recruitment. Right. And, and I would not be surprised to see him open things back up uh, a little bit later in this process, you know, with his official visits in the summer, potentially things of that nature. Uh, he was on point with every single throw. Same thing for Mike Alhado, who was the DEFCON quarterback, Bishop Borman, uh, you know, Nevada Gatorade player of the year, 55 touchdowns. The only knock on him is that he's a five foot eight, 170 yeah. <laughs> pound quarterback. Right. But he just committed to Hawaii. Uh, Timmy Chang, uh, who broke a, a ton of records at the University of Hawaii, uh, very similar passer to him, uh, sees a lot of those traits in him. And he's one of the best quarterbacks in seven on seven that we've seen pretty much in every tournament, played the Trillion Boys. I don't know if you got a chance to go out to any of the other, other OT7 tournaments, but he's a baller. Another guy that was actually interested in Miami, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Miami get back in the races with Isaiah Williams, uh, who broke his collarbone last year at Carrollwood Day. Um, and is one of the most explosive receivers in this 2024 class. He looked really good for that Legends 7-on-17, seven seven which is a Tampa Bay squad. Um, you know, he's about 6 foot, 5'11", 6 foot, but 4'4 four, four speed, and, and he shined through every time that boy went vertical. So uh, I would not be surprised to see Miami potentially jump back in the race there. The 2025 and 2026 kids were impressive, especially on that DEFCON team that won the championship. South Florida-based receivers, I know – it looks like Jeremiah Smith is probably going to be locked in with Ohio State at this point. Miami, of course, still very much in play for JoJo Trader. You mentioned Chance Robinson. If they get Loway McCoy, that's a pretty good receiver, all those three kids. But you think about 25 and 26, and this is the first time I really focused. I went out to that uh, DEF CON practice, the script preseason scrimmage, when they, when they were kind of picking guys, and I saw these dudes there. But Wade and Charles, uh, Kamari Williams, you want to talk about some of those dudes and, and some of the elite younger receivers in 25 and 26 that we should be focused on. Yeah. Kamari Williams just popped the Miami offer actually. So that's, mm -hmm. that's an interesting development. He, you know, he went on a visit this morning um, and from everything I heard is that it went really well. And Kevin Beard is now on his trail pretty heavily. He was pretty much an unknown uh, yeah. until January. Uh, the seven on seven season kind of opened the eyes of a lot of people, but he was a dominant player last year, 900 yards, 11 touchdowns, and he's continued that success into the seven-on-seven -seven season. He had the catch of the weekend, snatching a ball from a, who was, from a kid who was also a four-star player. Um, and, and, and he Charles showed – right? 
It was actually that one was uh, Tony Williams, so Tony Palm Williams, Beach Central okay. kid. So they actually have a good relationship. So I know people see the video and they see him celebrating <laughs> and doing going crazy, but they have a relationship with each other. They've known each other for a long time. Both Palm Beach kids. So uh, that was a fun, fun tournament for Kamari Williams because he was dominant, uh, especially as a vertical jump ball guy. He's a six foot four, hundred and eighty pound kid uh, who who will be over thirty offers. Same thing for Wade and Charles. We we saw you know what he did over the entirety of the tournament. He did that in New Orleans as well. Um, at a viral one-handed catch, I think that's over like three hundred thousand views right now. Uh, he's he's all of six foot two, hundred and eighty, hundred and eighty-five pounds. Miami's been on his trail since last season. I've gotten him, 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 and his teammate Daenerys Gray, who is a special player in twenty twenty-six on campus. Um, and I think Miami's the leader for for both Daenerys and Wade right now. Kamari, it's going to be a little bit of a process because they just started really that evaluation and connection with him. Uh, so uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, but Shamanad and Miami have a pretty long relationship with each other. So I would not be surprised to see him on campus a few more times. Frank, when you evaluate guys, and I've had these conversations with Larry Bluestein and Charles Fishbein and Andrew Ivins and all the guys who, who do analysis on, on recruits, what are some of the key things you look for in a player that tells you he's going to, he has the potential to be special, not just a guy who's pretty good in high school and gets a scholarship, but a guy who's going to take the steps necessary once he gets to college to put himself in position to be an NFL player. Yeah. Well, just for example, these, these three kids from Boynton beach, Kamari, Wade, and Daenerys, they are grinders. If there's a practice, those kids are at it. Uh, they, they are, they just have, there's a certain mentality to the South Florida kids that are successful outside of just being physical freaks. We know that South Florida is always going to have talent, but we see a ton of talent continue to go by the wayside once they hit the next level. I think that a kid has to have that, that Mamba mentality, I guess you could say, to be successful. And I think that South Florida has an abundance of that right now. You look at just the running back position. You got Davion Gowers, Jordan Lyle. Stacey Gage, who was a Tampa transplant, right? Like at receiver, it's an abundance of kids, right? You got Jeremiah Smith, Josiah Trader, Chance Robinson. All these kids are grinders. They want to play the best. They want to be around the best. That's why you see the seven on seven teams so dominant in the South Florida region. That's why you see the South Florida teams like the Miami Centrals, the Shamanah Madonnas, the St. Thomas Aquinas. They're beating the national teams in other places, right? Because we're seeing kids that are, they're doing football all year round. It's not so much kids just playing football because they, they just want to play football. It's, it's kids that are obsessed with this game. And when I do my evaluations on kids, I, a lot of it goes into production. A lot of it goes into film. And a lot of it goes into just, you know, seeing what type of kid they are on and off the field. And yeah. uh, I feel like we got a lot of kids that, that check all the boxes. And there's a reason Miami is recruiting South Florida so heavily in this 2024, 2025, and 2026 classes. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think at the skill positions, it's one of those things that, you know, and even at edge rushers, when, when you've got, you know, uh, you know, the Reuben Baines of the world, uh, right, you, you can sort of see some of the key ingredients. I, I, for me, it's intelligence, Frank. I, when, I, when I talk to these kids, I want to be able to have a, a conversation with them where I feel like they're mature, they know what they want in life, they're driven, I think when you see those things versus, hey, man, check out how many followers I have on Twitter. Or look at my Instagram page or, you know, when they're sort of focused on the right things, that's what always sort of tells me. Is this kid serious about football or he's, he's not? Because I've come across guys super talented over the years that to me, they just don't always have maybe their priority straight. Maybe it's not a product of, of themselves, but maybe people they're around. Right. Maybe having the right people around them, right influence, et cetera. Um, and, and I think for, for Mario Cristobal to separate himself from some of the pr previous recruiting mistakes made by Miami coaches, he needs to be really on top of that and pick the best kids out of South Florida, not just all the kids out of South Florida, because some of these kids don't come up the way you want them to. And when they come to your university, it can, it can infest the locker room in the wrong way and create the wrong type of chemistry and uh, that, that you want. And, and hopefully Mario, uh, it, you know, he, look, he's got a great reputation uh, for picking the right kind of kids, Hopefully he continues to do that, and that helps Miami get over the edge here. Yeah, absolutely, and, and Mario's doing just that. That's why when people get mad about the three-star kids, you want kids that want to be in the program, right? Like right. It, It's great to have four- and five-star guys, but we saw Ole Miss with Hugh Freeze not that long ago 
you know, grab the number one player at three different positions. And I don't think they ever won more than like nine games in a season. And he ended up actually being fired, obviously, for other reasons, but also lack of success went into that as well. We continuously see teams that kill it in recruiting and don't do well. Texas A&M went five and seven last season. Same as Miami. They have killed it in recruiting since Jimbo Fisher has been there. Not everybody is Georgia that's getting five star kids and developing them. It, it's it's getting guys in the program that want to be there. And, and a guy like Dylan Day, who has built a strong bond with Lance Godfrey, that's an important factor. A guy who's going to run through a wall for his defense coordinator. Judd Anderson and Shannon Dawson are like two peas in a pod, right? Like we've seen that we've seen them on their visit together extensively with pictures, right? He was a major part of that photo shoot, yeah. right? And, and when Judd Anderson talks about Shannon Dawson, it's about the type of person that he is and, and things like that. So I, I love the kids that they're getting because these are kids that want to be Miami Hurricanes. And when you talk to legends that are formerly in the program, they, they say, bring guys in that want to be Canes because it, it's not easy to be a Cane. Absolutely, 100%. Um, I wanted us to tackle a few mailbag questions. I don't know how many recruiting questions we got in here, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sift through this right now and and see if we uh, we can pick a go some good ones out. Um, all right, here we go. Here, <laughs> so many TVD related questions. So I apologize. Um, Everybody freaking out about TVD boy. <laughs> Uh, any updates on Zion Nelson? What do you think the starting five offensive line will be on September 1st? This is from Marcus Williams on Twitter. He's known as money cane. Uh, what about Zion? Your thoughts on him? I, I saw him at the spring game. Um, and he looked obviously a little overweight. I know he's had two knee surgeries in a year, obviously tried to come back quickly to get things, uh, you know, sort of going right. Uh, and it, and it just sort of backfired on him. What are your thoughts on Zion? Is he going to be in the starting five come September 1st? I have no clue. I think it was a positive development to see him without a brace, though. We saw yeah. him. He wasn't He wasn't gimpy, right? We didn't right. obviously see him run or anything, but we've seen him on crutches as early as January. So it, it's it's a positive development to see him kind of get back to normal life. That means that things are getting healthier, I think. I, I still probably wouldn't expect him to be in that starting lineup day one. Uh, it's probably going to be Jalen Rivers, but he looked pretty rough. So Miami could probably rush Zion Nelson back, maybe, you know, push that, that you know, the treatment plan up a little bit because they're going to need that. Or Samson Okunlola is going to be that – he's going to have to be that five-star guy because I don't know if you can survive with Jalen – you can't be a 10-win team with Jalen Rivers as your left tackle right now. He just didn't look good enough. I think he'll have three sacks, multiple pressures. He's really designed better to be an offensive guard. Um, honestly, it wouldn't, wouldn't be surprising for me to see a JV on Cohen potentially jump out at left tackle. He has experience playing the position. Um, I think Inez Cooper's locked into one of those guard spots. Matt Lee, we know is locked in as the leader of that offensive line at center. And Francis Malago is going to be that right tackle. He looked good in that spring game, yeah. exponentially better than Jalen Rivers. So I think your big question right now is that left tackle spot. And I still think it's probably going to be Jalen Rivers if I had to put my money on it, but if Zion's able to get healthy and get through that rehab, he'll be the guy. Zion has better feet for tackle. Um, if he's if he's healthy, he's I think he should be your starting left tackle. I, Samson Okolola, I think, is going to be a stud here. I think he's got a lot of good ingredients. But I, I think you can only really play true freshmen when they're ready. I don't want him to lose his confidence or have his, his confidence shaken at all. So I think if you're a Miami fan, you want Zion Nelson to come back, push Jalen Rivers, and the best man win. And that's your starting left tackle. Um, so hopefully that's what happens here. Um, all right. This is from, uh, this is a long name on Twitter. So I apologize. Uh, let me see. It's Larian, but he says iPod, AKA, I don't know, something else there. Uh, <laughs> what, when do you see the NIL market settling into some place of stability slash regulation? <coughs> Meaning uh, essentially a top QB can expect to see X dollars and basically no school is going to top that number almost like a salary cap of sorts. I don't know that we're ever headed towards a salary cap, Frank. I mean, there's no way to regulate that. Yeah, I, I think the NCAA made a huge mistake by not taking this and just type in type thing where they were offering kids a certain amount of money uh, as like a revenue split, basically, right? Because if they would have done just that, we would have avoided this NIL issue completely. But it is now out of the NCAA's hands, really. 
it, this is a free market operation that they got going on. And yeah. I think that the money is only going to continue to increase unless we get less and less talent. Right. But you're going to, and honestly, I don't have a problem with the NIL because you're seeing schools that typically don't have a chance, have a chance. Now it, there are schools with money that you don't think have money. Like Bama doesn't have money. Like everybody thinks they do. The majority of billionaires out of Alabama went to Auburn. I think five out of seven billionaires in Alabama went to Auburn. Right. Right. It, you look at Georgia, Georgia's not paying their guys at a substantial amount of money in NIL. It, it's Ohio State. They're not paying their freshmen to come in. So I think that it's it's almost like an, an even playing field now because Miami might not have had a chance on a Francis Malago coming off a five and seven season. They might not have had a chance on a Samson Open Lola after a five and seven season. And I don't think that changes because billionaires are going to want to spend money always. And if they want to control the narrative on something, they're going to do just that. And yeah. you're, and I don't think that the government is going to step in at any point and say, you guys can only spend this much money. And if they do, people are going to get around it the same way that they did before, right? When, when Alabama was supposedly giving out Camaros, right? Yeah. And Tennessee was giving out McDonald's bags with hundred dollar, you know, bunches of hundred dollar bills, right? That those things happened against the rule. Right. So I think there's always going to be an, an exorbitant amount of money that's involved in college football. And that's really never going to change. There's not a salary cap because this is not the NFL. Yeah. It's too many schools to regulate, too many different conferences, rules, et cetera. So I think in the end, uh, having a salary cap just isn't going to work unless the NCAA decides to take an unprecedented step and just share revenue in, in a way where, where now, you know, there, there can be some sort of system, but they're not going to ever take that step. They're going to make it name, image, and likeness because they're going to keep their money that way. They're not going to have to worry about it affecting them, uh, their bottom line and their TV contracts, et cetera. Um, all right. This is from uh, D Hernan, David Hernandez, who often uh, writes into the show. What do you make of the TVD situation? Is there an NIL issue with Miami? Boosters are not enough people putting money into the players. We talked about this, obviously, for a while early on in the podcast. David, hopefully you can rewind back to that part and listen to our answers. Again, I don't think there's any problems with Miami's NIL. Um, we'll, we'll skip here to the next question. Um, more NIL questions. That's it. Uh, Frank, I think we're going to wrap it up. I don't have any other questions that, that are kind of non uh, NIL or TVD related questions. Obviously, so many people hope the TVD put out a statement at all yet when we've been sitting here talking or no. I don't know. I got to look this up because he has really been off social media lately, like nothing yeah. on Instagram since 2022 in July. Let's see. I just looked at his Twitter and I don't see it. So um, nothing. Yeah, yeah so nothing we'll since see. January. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident with some of the information I've received that he's going to be coming back. So, hopefully, we don't have to scrap this whole podcast and start brand new. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, listen, you can give me a call. I'm jumping on whenever you need me to. So, <laughs> all right, man. Any parting thoughts for you here? I mean, uh, coming off the spring, any final thoughts on the spring game or, or anything important to know here as we, as we wrap this thing up? I think fans just got to know this offense is going to be fun this year. I think we're going to see a lot of speed. I think we're going to see guys utilize their skill set. So no games with no touchdowns, I think, this year. That's my bold prediction. And I also think that this class is going to end up at least a top 12, top 12 class in 2024. So really no need to panic. Don't listen to the people hating on huddle, you know, highlight tapes. Uh, and, and just trust the evaluations of this staff because they do an excellent job. They are thorough and they are trying to – put guys into this program that fit what they want to do. So I think good things are on the way. All right, Frank, I appreciate you coming on. Make sure to read all of Frank's work over at Canes County rivals affiliate. Uh, also follow him on Twitter at the crib South FLA. Frank, thanks for coming on, bro. It was fun. Thanks, Manny. I will talk to you soon.